reality that we are engaged with. So in that sense, I think uh, uh, both these presentations have been very, very exciting. And more in terms of they offer very clearly um, opportunities for us to, um, to wrestle with the kind of newer and newer challenges that are coming up in the political and the social and so on. And uh, that we can, um, um, we do have enormous, uh, uh, an enormous bank of philosophical, empirical, investigative resources with which to come up with creative theory, if that is the ambition that we have. Okay, so in that sense, I think we've set the stage perfectly for, uh, for Gopal Bhai's uh, a presentation on reflections on doing theory. <laughs> yeah. I must thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to share uh, my ongoing concerns about uh, the possibility of uh, creating creative theory and we have been debating for all these years since uh, since the time Manu wrote his important text on creative theory uh, that was about uh, 10 years back maybe you wrote that uh, text uh, we have been debating whether it is, should we call it a creative theory, should we call it subversive theory, alternative theory, what theory should we call it? If we call it uh, a creative theory, are we not really transgressing the boundaries of doing theory? Because creativity belongs to literature, music and other things. So can you really import that language into, so to say, serious thinking? as a uh, no, serious arithmetic of doing theory. Uh, that is one uh, protocol question that one will have to address uh, uh, in the coming future, uh, both among ourselves and with the students and other larger biradari in this country. And I'd say in this country only. Uh, because there are people who are coming from outside and they are giving us some, you know, uh, lessons and we become endangered labor for them. So, <coughs> so I'm just saying that it is simply this country. So this one protocol question that we have to ha handle. Uh, I'm not going to di discuss this question at the moment, uh, neither I have any energy to do it. But this is a crucial question that we face in our own uh, academic and political life in this country. Uh, the second question, which I will not, I will just, I will just flag out and not discuss in greater length, is the ethics of doing theory. Uh, ethics of doing theory becomes important because uh, we are already foregrounding our need to develop critical theory or creative theory in terms of the theory doing in this country, which is lacking ethics. Yeah, really for one day. We are actually admitting this. And therefore I am really very happy to be the part of this exercise. That we, there is a realization that you know there's something terribly wrong with what we think in this classroom, in through the textbooks and other other forums. <coughs> and we are already suggesting that there is some something terribly deficient, as Sujata and uh, Savita were pointing out. There is something really terribly wrong with, uh, in our country. Uh, but still we insist on with the theory which is done through uh, through some dominant mode of theorizing. And what is this dominant mode of theorizing, unfortunately, is uh, the the notion of a priori. I'm sorry, this burden of a priori has really crushed us so much that we have not been able to liberate ourselves from this a priori. Our theory is so a priori laden that it doesn't give any energy, any opportunity to think fresh. You follow so, so as, as a matter of habit, you follow uh, what is given to you a priori. A priori in the sense that, you know, you have certain, and uh, not a priori of, of uh, Plato, 
and you one can't. And I would say they also are not our priority. Sorry. Both of them, Plato requires a dark cave, then only his our priority becomes a possibility. And Kant requires a black fellow, a race, to become our priority. He is so critical of race, race his own anthropological text, philosophical anthropology on race, that he has to have that first negative reference point to become our priority. So our priority itself is a problematic thing. So, but we are all latching on it. We always hold this discussion. I can see the child sitting in the corner there. In our center, that we start from preposition. Our reference point is preposition. Sorry, how can it be your reference point? Not human being. Thanks to Professor Randeep saying he starts with human being. You don't start with human being, you start from preposition. How skewed, how ethically irresponsible we are, starting from preposition. And you know, we have to follow protocols of doing theory. Can we not start from Siddha? Can we, can we not start from some objects that are waiting for your, inter, in your, your attention? You don't start from what is happening in the ground, what is happening with the human being. You start from abstract principles because you really love protocols. This is what we are doing in we are actually damaging creative sensibilities of students by starting from preposition, abstract. As if, if you start from a textbook, uh, that's the enough condition for doing creative theory. Is that the condition? If that is not the condition, why would Manu said look at the rich understanding of rights is in the moment? Why would, say, why would he say that? Because he says, he's compelled to say because you are, you are a priori theory of rights and democracy really do not doesn't really help him to understand what is happening. Simple. Therefore, human-centric reality is your starting point. It has to be. But we are misleading ourselves. We are not only misleading ourselves, we are misleading our young generation. <coughs> they don't ask this question. We are doing so much of disservice to our own critical thinking. And why they are doing is an interesting thing. Why they are not following the ethical mode. Because that is the best way of hiding their guilt. And even students follow the same protocol. Because it is less painful. It is less fun. It is less painful. If you start from a priori, you have to really exclude all the empirical references that are staring at you. They are staring at you in different forms. You can really you can feel very cozy, comfortable in the classroom. And both of them really enjoy this. Being our priority, and that is not that that shouldn't be the part of your uh, doing. Therefore, I think before it is a creative theory, Manu, it is my submission is it has to be a critical theory basically to begin with. You have to critique these people on their own grounds. So this is the problem. But I I think I have a lot, I have a very uh, detailed argument on this. But I will withhold this argument at the moment. I am in the interest of time and in the interest of some everybody's patience. Now, the third point is about uh, uh, how do you start with this person who is caught, in the, caught into the question? Is he thrown into the question, as Heidegger would say, as uh, we can debate it? Is he thrown into the, he, he or she is thrown into the question? We have to find out. Mm, I have no idea, but we'll discuss this, but I'm just keeping it open. Yeah, thrownness. So this person is thrown into the uh, he's thrown into the historical questions of uh, uh, victims of the Brahmanical patriarchy, caste system, uh, economic aspect, everything. Should this person theorize, or somebody expert should theorize? And I think you are actually dealing with that. Should patient be theorizing his own illness, or you require expert? And do you get a guarantee? That person who is theorizing your experience will provide an adequate theory that will really capture reality in its totality. And therefore, I think it's an, uh, there will be a problem. Should we really capture reality in its totality if you take a plural mode, as Sujata is suggesting? You know, a very important point she is suggesting is to say uh, that you need to adopt, and I'm, I agree with you, a point, up to, up to a point, a non-linear theory of plural episteme. 
fantastic. Because we are dealing with the actual problem of the people. We are not inviting experts. Because experts have their own problems of politicizing. As we very rightly say, taking the analogy of doctors. Or should we really serialize episteme in such a way that you are doing theory acquires a critical age? And whether you like or not, modernity follows this journey actually. And it is not, we don't have our control on this. So we have to take a call. And I, I'm very happy, Sujata, we'll have a discussion in uh, anywhere we want on this uh, question of if your theory has to acquire some critical age and become politi politically sensitive and subversive, should we ser serialize it, sequentialize it, is the question. Because if you don't do that, and if it is open field, of FSTM existing side by side harmoniously with little tension, then how, from where will you get lead? That's the point. Uh, we can discuss this. Uh, but the issue remains uh, 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 to be addressed. <coughs> the issue is what, what are the resources that are available to a person who is caught into the historical question for theorizing her or his own life world and also making that life world communicable to others. So what is the vocabulary that he or she can? Can he or she adopt very, very private, private, private vocabulary to communicate it? Does he or she want to really communicate? And that is the generosity question that we are discussing. And Akhil Bilgram is brilliant piece on this. The, the, have we, by the way, have you really, really developed a theory of generosity while we are teaching theory? A challenge, no one talks about it. Not even in CPS. Oh, my, my, my own, my own insight. I don't want to share with them. If I share, then what will happen to me? My ego will be flattened. All these are mean tactics people use. You know? And so, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak frankly. Yeah? <laughs> I can do it in CPS as well, there's no problem. I do it, not Rajai. Wait to it. I am not scared because I am actually. So, uh, so that general situation, so what is the language, should a person who is actually a patient, to your, your metaphor Sujata, should he or she generously communicate? Because communication about a dirt, about a dirt, is disastrous. In a way, I mean, they just, we go beyond Julia Triste and all that. Because you don't want to share with others, explosive material. <coughs> Uh, and so, but who, I think for the larger interest, we have to share. You have to be generous. You can't hold it to yourself. That's why. But your, your theory should really generate that possibility, which is like ocean. You don't feel threatened by anybody. You're full of it. And you can always subtract it to others. How many of the scholars here, and I'm not talking about NRI scholars, how many of them show their generosity? They simply go to the Tinmurti and uh, somewhere and sit and like ghost they write something for oh, my, my, my book. What the hell your book? It's not your book. Anyway, so that is, uh, uh, that's important. But therefore, uh, the point that I'm raising is about what are the epistemic resources, epistemological resources that can really produce adequate theory of reality and aspirational theory of reality. That is a chance. It, it inspires you. Therefore, the, the, the agenda for creative theory is to be aspirational. You know, it really addresses the aspirations of common people who are caught into the questions. Liberation. Now, here is a problem, methodological problem. Can you really, therefore, accommodate the expression, and, uh, and Savita was making that point, expressions that are not purely rational, reasonable. They are sometimes irrational, so to say. They are emotional. Can you really accommodate, accommodate them into your theory? And I'll just take last point, uh, uh, Madhurika, and that's a part. I think, and I was against it, you know, uh, uh, when I said uh, li literature in my, that, you know, uh, how egalitarian, uh, literature is a poor substitute for serious theory. So, but I am now changing. Uh, I, because Maninda forced me to change it. And uh, thanks, Manin, it's good to have Maninda. Uh, 
uh, very immediate in one's door and not, not, not immediate next door is Ajay, so he has a little time for me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, can we, and we had a brilliant discussion in the class, Henry, I'm just sorry for saying this. Henry is a movie which has got the national award. It's a Marathi movie which is about, Henry is the name of the pig. A pig. It's in Bengali language, a local language, it's pig. I think that provides a re rich material to do a meaningful transformative theory. Theory which is transformative, which is looking at liberation. And in that movie, uh, the, the, one can develop the theory of the self. I know time, because you haven't seen the movie, many of you. Uh, theory of the self, theory of uh, structure, st structuration, uh, moral theory of self-respect, moral theory of self-respect, and theory of space. Several things. It is a paradigmatic offer. Fandry is a paradigmatic offer. Therefore, movie theater, um, the way they, I mean, you have done work on this, and I don't have much to offer. Our film studies are also skewed. Partly because you very rightly warned us about the postmodern stuff. They take us into some language which is, which is un, un, unintelligible to me. You know? But and that's the postmodern turn to cultural studies and film studies and all that. And they are the ones who are taken over. But Fandry is actually load, it's, it's loaded with all these theoretical possibilities. Just open up. And we'll get to, we'll actually we can therefore uh, reconfigure. Reconfiguration is the point. You can reconfigure your theory on different, different, different footings altogether. And that is a possibility and we, I can do that uh, with my limited knowledge maybe in the next meeting. At the moment I will stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just took 15 minutes. Yes, uh, I, yeah, no, I was uh, wondering what I should do with the time, then I thought I'd let it flow because it'll flow anyway. So, uh, but this has been uh, just, Manind, you can't exit at this point. <laughs> Housekeeping, is it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I just, no, there is a very important uh, housekeeping point at this time. This was the time when we were meant to break for tea. And I know that IIC is very particular about you know, their serving times and so on. So do you want to clarify that? Because we we can't um, sacrifice on the discussion. So how do we do it? Because this is... I know you are going to say something. Sorry? Say that. Celebrate the moment. So you can continue this question. Ah, no, no, absolutely. No, I thought, uh, you know, he may as well go and do it. Um, Now, you know when Professor Mahanti says, do this, then I get very nervous. I don't know what I'm uh, I think, since so many nuanced um, arguments have been made, let me just point towards one or two broad um, themes, which all of them are alluding to and which have to be part of the exercise of doing creative theory. Um, the fundamental, of course, is to relate any kind of exercise of creating theory to the ground. And I think that, therefore, um, a creative theory exercise has to be one in which we are rethinking the theoretical, naturally, but along with that, we have to rethink the empirical. Um, we were trained with a strange discomfort about the empirical, a strange, uh, you know, sort of hesitation. Uh, to understand the empirical, partly because the empirical was cast into very uh, 
watertight categories which seemed to be which seemed to be uh, non compatible with a serious theoretical exercise i remember that when i finished my masters i mean this was the kind of binary i had in my mind however the kind of political deeply political orientation that we got as well in studying politics forced us to take cognizance of the ground and to unpack the empirical in different ways and to be able to cast the empirical in categories that were lending themselves to a familiar theorization but in the process we also discovered that the familiar theorization trajectories or the methodologies as sabita and gopal bhai has so beautifully pointed out need not be in accordance with received wisdom at all that was a problem because the minute you start unpacking the empirical and looking at all kinds of fluid categories in the empirical the received wisdom of the theory does not allow you to understand or to accommodate and then you realize that you cannot have you cannot be theorizing just in a in that random way which only can accommodate the comfortable categories of the empirical your empirical is the reality and you jolly well take cognizance of it so therefore the there needs to be a revisiting of the theory and in that exercise i think this the last 25 30 years since we finished masters there's been so many of us wrestling with you know the the relation wrestling with the categories of the empirical the categories of the theoretical and reworking the relationship between the two and if i were to kind of generalize on the kind of points that all of them have been making this is one very important point that uh, has come up there. and it's in the unpacking of the received wisdom of the theoretical that we have gone in search of so many different sources of philosophical and theoretical reflection and have been rewarded with very rich uh, finds and um, yet i know that uh, i mean at one level i mean i i find uh, myself located very in a very interesting way trained in the discipline of political science i i can understand and engage with a part of the kind of things that kapil bhai and sarda are talking about but having gone deep into the empirical world of medicine and the so called alternative medical traditions i have a huge affinity with sujata's work and like sujata been trying to explore the uh, the the ground getting into it more and more and trying to bring the critical questions that we be trained with in social theory to the kind of ground that we are and having um, we be doing this for the last 25 years and yet when we meet today we are suddenly confronted with a new set of questions because a, a student of ours is working on a new dimension and we find that it's a totally unpacked category which is gender in traditional medicine uh, to use a very standard term traditional medicine so what i'm saying or all i'm trying to say at this point is that this is this is the, the this is the kind of journey uh, uh, that um, all of us in different ways have been undertaking and uh, so this kind of dialogue is also very important because those of us who have uh, engaged with you know questions on the ground need to be able to periodically uh, engage with so other alternative kinds of sources and modes of theorizing that enable us to believe that what we can see on the ground is not is 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 a reality which we need to engage with so um in that sense you know calling this session knowledge and society is uh, very interesting because what we are questioning we are actually we are looking at a very different view of society we can see different things in the same society that we study and thereby it reconstitutes the knowledge that we have to both understand explain and eventually of course to transform society because that's the purpose 
Okay, so I don't I don't want to say more than that, but we need to also know for money is what we are doing. Come back, yeah, maybe. Okay, so we'll take a break. They won't wait. That. I know. Uh, and Gopal Bhai request. So shall we? <laughs> so do we all? We go behind you. Shall we be very disciplined about this? But can we do 10 minutes? It's ambitious, but 10 minutes. <laughs>